Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth. We're excited to bring today's episode to you, featuring Kelsey and Mikkel, a lesbian couple sharing their story of coming out, divorcing their husbands, each were in a mixed orientation marriage, finding authenticity in their path, and understanding what their future holds in store for each of them. The Latter Gay Stories podcast is made possible through the generous donations through people just like you. If you believe in the mission of the Latter Gay Stories podcast and want to help us continue building bridges between the LDS and LGBT community, we invite you to make a donation. There are two simple and easy ways of donating to the podcast. First, by visiting our website at LatterGayStories.org and clicking on the Donate tab. You can also make a quick and easy donation right now by sending us a text to 77948. Text the word STORIES, S-T-O-R-I-E-S, to 77948. Your donation will help us to create stories just like this, informing the LDS community, the general public, friends, and family about topics surrounding the LGBT community. We appreciate your donations. We are excited again to welcome Kelsey and Mikkel to the Latter Gay Stories podcast and welcome them to the show. Thank you. Let's jump in it, and into it a little bit. Maybe let's start with, um, let's start with Mikkel. Uh, tell us a little bit about your story. Um, you're, you're lesbian, uh, you grew up in the church. Um, at what point did you realize I'm different? Where, where, where does the story start? So it's really interesting because I'm not sure that I, I understood that I was that much different than anybody else. I spent a lot of my life trying to please and fit in as best as I could. Um, I grew up in a family where if you were different, you were often made fun of or ridiculed. So I learned very early to just keep quiet about anything that would, you know, rock the boat. Um, and it, it wasn't until, you know, later in life, a couple of years ago, that I started to question, okay, I, you know, I'm not super happy in my marriage. It's not like we weren't good people, both good people, just not, not the, as happy as we could be. But I didn't really understand what that looked like because my parents' marriage was super dysfunctional, so I didn't grow up with a very good example of what a good marriage should look like. Plus, being LDS, I just thought, you know, this is, we just have to make it work. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I started to really notice thoughts and feelings and started to give voice to those. Very interesting. So, um, so, so growing up um, as a young woman, especially in the young women's organization of the church, and, and so I'm, I'm leading down this trail a little bit because I think there are often, especially in our audience, um, closeted young women who would listen to this podcast and say, I identify with this. Um, so I, I want to try to best understand through both of your stories, telltale signs, um, things that you noticed, things that seemed so taboo, and now looking back seemed like anthills instead of mountains. Right, so there were, there were a couple of times where, you know, I'd have really close girlfriends but just figured those were my best friends and not realizing that I actually had crushes on them. Um, I never got asked out on a date by another, you know, a member of the opposite sex. So I never had that opportunity to figure things out earlier. I grew up in a very strict household as well. So, you know, I didn't have friends over. I didn't get together with friends very often. And if I did, it was, you know, be home by nine o'clock and parents calling to check on me to make sure I, that's where I actually was and and uh, so just in, in an effort to make sure I was checking all of the boxes you know reading my scriptures and praying and going to church and going to seminary I just learned to just stuff. What about you Kelsey? My story is a little different I knew when I was younger that that I, I, I didn't necessarily have words for it because when you're 10 years old, you know, I, I didn't really identify as gay at that time, but I knew that there was something different about me. We didn't talk about being gay or anybody in the LGBTQ community in my home, because as well, I grew up LDS. 
Um, but I remember having crushes on girls all through elementary and even had a crush on one of the assistant teachers that came in from the college who was this young, cute, cute girl. <laughs> and uh, I just remember like all the boys in my class having a crush on her and I was right there with them. You know, I, I loved, loved girls and I knew it when I was younger. Um, and so I tried really hard to hide it though. I didn't want anyone to know. So I recognized it and I knew it from a younger age. It was just sometimes when I would see certain girls, I would, you know, get that fluttery feeling and just like, oh, they're, I really like them and I want to be around them all the time. Um, but I would constantly just like Mikkel said, push it down. It's, you know, we've got to make it through this. The church had other plans, you know, they had a plan and this is, the plan is to marry a man and be happy, you know, and happily ever after that way. So I thought that that was what I was supposed to do. So I tried, I tried really hard. Um, I had a, a boyfriend at one point in high school. For some reason, I didn't date a lot of guys. Surprise. No, surprise, surprise. <laughs> surprise. I didn't either. <laughs> Bummer. Um, so, yeah, I had ended up having one boyfriend in high school, but it didn't last very long. Um, and then in high school, I ended up having a girlfriend that we, we were in secret. We didn't want anybody to know. I lived in a small town, so it was, it was really difficult for us. So we, you know, any time we had by ourselves was very precious but we also didn't get a lot just because we were trying to hide because um, we were both LDS and then yeah it it didn't end up lasting because we both decided that well we need to follow the plan we need to be done with each other and move on and try to you know forget what we have felt and what we've experienced and be good LDS religious livers. <laughs> so you both grew up in, you each grew up in Utah towns. So I spent quite a bit of time in Utah in various places. My dad was in the military when I was young and, and then when he got out, we just moved every couple of years. So spent quite a bit of time in Utah. The middle of my 10th grade year, we moved to Pennsylvania. So you became Amish. <laughs> uh, yeah, I became the only Mormon pretty much in my whole school. So that, that was interesting too, because it, it, you know, there were a lot of eyes on me at that time. Mormonism was fascinating to a lot of people who didn't really understand Mormons or didn't have a lot of exposure. And of course the exposure that they had was all negative polygamy. And I had one friend in high school ask me where my horns were, had heard that Mormons have horns and just weird kind of random things. I had another friend ask me if I, I was allowed to use other people's bathrooms, their restroom, because they had heard that we could only use our restrooms at our own home. So just weird things. And so it, it, that was a, a time for me to like, you know, be on top of things. I, I wanted to really know my religion and really live it because I had a lot of people watching, you know, and it was stressed at, at, at that time in my life. Um, being a good example was stressed, you know, in church and in seminary and and those kinds of kinds of things, and I wanted to be a good example. Makes sense. Uh, what about you, Kelsey? I grew up in Utah. Yeah. So, so small town, I get it. Yeah. Yep. What At what point did you start identify? So, so I, and I know with your story, Mikkel, it came a little later in life. Um, was there a point where you were able to, Kelsey, put a name or a label on what you were feeling? And and at what? How, how did that happen? At what point did you say? I think growing up in a small town, there was someone else who had posted on the Latter Day Stories website and said, I, I grew up in a gay ghost town. I didn't know anyone who was gay right. and I didn't know what it was like to be gay. Yeah. yeah. So at what point did that change? At what point did you finally say, this is what it is? Um, probably not until high school when I had my girlfriend because before then I, I almost didn't want to admit that it was there because I felt like something was wrong with me. I felt like I was broken. And so I just wanted to pretend like nothing was there. But when I started acting on it, when, when I had my girlfriend, then I think at that time is when I, 
I realized and really put that name on it that uh, I'm gay, I'm, I'm a lesbian. But I still didn't ever want to really say it out loud because <laughs> I just, you don't, I was so afraid of disappointing. I was so afraid of not being good enough or doing enough to, to make everyone else happy and to get me where I needed to be. I, I felt like my salvation pinned on this and I, I had to, <laughs> I had to fix myself. There's a lot of shame associated with even giving words to it. At least there was, you know, in, in my family and in the LDS culture that I grew up in. You know, I didn't, I had never heard of or seen another gay person except to hear about it in a negative context. And so I think that at least for me, especially in, in the process of trying to figure things out, um, there's a lot of shame attached. And in my high school, there was only one kid that I knew of that was gay. And um, he, he got a lot of crap from people in that small community. And so there was, there was a lot of fear and a lot of shame and just didn't, wanna, <laughs> didn't want that to come out. This is great space to explore this topic of shame um, because I, I see a, I mean, obviously being within the community, a closeted community, mm -hmm. uh, there are a million reasons why people stay closeted to avoid the realities of how people treat other people. Mm -hmm. Life is difficult enough. Right. And then when you add something like sexuality into the mix, it gets even more difficult. So let's have a candid conversation about the difficult things that family members, friends say, especially to a closeted person where you hear those words. How does it affect you? What impact does that have on your life? I, we, we've talked about shame, shame, shame. So obviously there, there's a lot of built up shame there. Um, maybe some examples of what, what you remember here, what you remember hearing, what you remember experiencing that still resonates part of your fabric today that you just can't shake and, and how people can do better as a result of maybe something you can tell us. So, you know, again, nothing I had heard about um, from my family or from my LDS community about gay people was positive. It was, you know, they're wrong. It's, it's unnatural. Um, they, it's a choice. And so there was a lot of that in, in me thinking about coming out those feelings and those thoughts, you know, me trying, you know, I tried for a long time to just, maybe I'm just not doing good enough. Maybe I just need to try harder. So there's self shame, shame that I placed on myself for acknowledging the thoughts and acknowledging the feelings and giving space to that and giving voice to it. And then there's shame that you get from, you know, your family and from LDS community. Um, I was in counseling um, during this process of coming out and my counselor who was supposed to be LGBTQ friendly told me that I should not tell my children because it was it would be like child abuse. They did not need to know my sexuality. So again, I'm, I, you know, I, I had come out to my, my now ex-husband and a few family members and not to my children yet. You know, my, my oldest is 19. And so trying to, to face that, how do you, how do you reconcile that? And I, we want to, I definitely want to jump into the mixed orientation marriage. It's where all three of us have probably a few decades worth of good experiences. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Kelsey? Things you remember? Um, most of the experiences I remember are just from school, seeing what other kids said and did to this, this boy that was gay in my school. My parents, I don't remember them ever talking about anything. Um, I think that they were... In fact, they've admitted that they were very naive. They just didn't know anything about the gay community. And so we never really talked about it. I never heard my parents talk poorly of anyone or anything about that. So I lucked out in, in that aspect that I didn't get that from, from my family, from my parents or siblings. Um, but I did get that from my ex-husband. So... Um, I just remember I actually came out to him just after we got married and when I did he basically just said well you're married to me now we'll just sweep that under the rug 
and he would make comments. He wouldn't let us watch anything with Ellen DeGeneres because, you know, she was she was gay and that was a bad thing. So he would he would make comments about how people were bad that were like this and it just made me feel like I I was locked up. I couldn't say anything. We couldn't talk about it. So that was probably the hardest experience that I had. Any advice to a closeted young woman who stands at this door and says, is it worth coming out? Um, who, and maybe jump back just back, back to that point before, and because next we'll talk about coming out experience, but the day before you're coming out or the month before coming out, what advice would you give someone who stood in those, that threshold, your same shoes? So I would say, it, it was always a struggle for me to feel like I could be myself in the closet. I, I went through a ton of self-improvement courses and coaching programs and books and everything because I thought there was something innately wrong with me that I needed to fix. And um, since embracing every part of myself, I feel so much more happy. I feel so much more at peace. I have so much less anxiety and I have, like I would, I would have so many emotional breakdowns just trying to sort through life and I find that I'm way more happier and it's interesting this may be maybe too personal but the whole time I was married 19 years I was married I never felt completely comfortable with my husband I didn't want him to see me undress I didn't want to shower with him I you know lots of things were uncomfortable holding hands and kissing and all of those things and now this feels like the most normal and natural thing. This is the way that it always should have been. And I didn't know it until I was on the other side. Great, great advice. Um, you're okay. Yeah. That's what I, I want them to know is that for so long, I felt like I was broken, that there was something wrong with me. And I just would want every every person who's still in the closet to know that there's nothing wrong with them that that they are a normal human being and this doesn't change that in any way and i would love for them to know that yes it's going to be hard and it's going to hurt and like you kind of said before you're probably gonna lose a lot of things but you will gain more than you ever could imagine. So hang on, it's gonna hurt. <laughs> it's gonna hurt, but there is such a wonderful community out here that has their arms wide open and are waiting to just support and love. So we're here for you. And it's not, I would say, I would add to that, it's not just um, the LGBTQ community, but there's allies that are that are available to who just want to love and support as best as they can. And I would, in my process of coming out, have experienced that, you know, in, in massive ways that I wouldn't have expected. That leads right in. Kelsey, let's start with the coming out experience. Oh boy. All right, <laughs> here we go. Um, so I, I had, I actually, okay. I came out to a college bishop actually um, he was the first adult I, I had talked to. I actually came out to my Singles Ward Relief Society president because I had a crush on her. Um, <laughs> uh, and she was straight, so that didn't work out so well for me. But, Best laid plans. <laughs> right, right. But she, she actually was a great help to me um, in that time because I was still trying to traverse... Mormonism I, and religion with being gay. And so she was a huge help to me in helping me to feel like I was okay, that this is okay, you'll be all right. Um, and so she suggested I go and talk to a bishop. So I went and talked to our bishop of that singles ward. And he actually was amazing. Um, he didn't make me feel less than, he didn't make me feel like I was broken. Um, and he kind of did the same thing where it's like, well, if you're trying to do better and you're not acting on it, you know, keep on, keep on keeping on, you're doing good. 
Um, <clears throat> and then he later made me Relief Society president. So that also verified to me like, okay, I'm, I'm okay. Like, he's not scared of me because uh, sometimes you feel like you have some kind of disease or something. People, you know, push away from you. They don't want to talk to you. And, and that was a great moment for me. Um, I officially came out of the closet. I was married, um, had been married for six years and had two kids. And I hit a point when I just couldn't do it anymore. I was not happy. Um, I loved my children. They are the world to me. But I was not happy in my marriage. And I knew that I couldn't keep going on that way. So um, I came out. I had come out to my husband, like I said, just after we got married. Less than a year after we got married. And he thought you know, that it was all fixed, that it would be okay. What, what, what took you to that point? Were you decided or were you compelled to come out to your husband? Um, I think because it was so miserable. <laughs> it sounds so awful. Yes, I was compelled. Um, you know, they, they tell us that marriage is this wonderful thing and, and not even a year into the marriage, I was going, what on earth did I do? <laughs> this is is this the way it's supposed to be? Nobody, I was not expecting this. And so I think at that point I told him just kind of like a, hey, by the way, I'm gay. And does that change anything? And for him, it was like, well, I'm going to fix you. And so then I felt like, okay, this is just what I need to do. So then I just buckled down as hard as I could and, and tried to make it work. What, 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 explain to us what that looks like by trying to make it work what was the Ooh. routine what what things were you implementing into your life to say this will change this or what was your ex expectation and maybe that's the better question ah uh, um i was just uh, i was going through the mechanics of of life is really how it was um because i wasn't happy sincerely happy now that that's kind of a funny thing because my parents if you ask them will tell you that I was their happy child so even though I had this it was about um, age 10 I remember I was so sad I was struggling and I think it was because of this internal battle I was having with myself where my authentic self wanted to come out my authentic self was just like uh yeah let's just be you and i was battling that in religion and i was feeling so sad and i finally decided that i would be happy that no matter what i was going to choose to be happy and so i kind of used that same mentality in my marriage where i was like okay i hurt this isn't fun i don't enjoy this but I'm going to choose to be happy. And so I tried to find happiness in everything and everywhere that I could. And that's what got me through the six years. Um, and to a lot of people, I probably seemed very happy. And it's because I tried really hard to find that happiness in any and every place that I could. Um, and yeah, it got me it got me six years. <laughs> Kelsey, let's continue to talk about um, these ways that you were searching for happiness. How were you implementing spirituality and faith, especially in Mormonism, into this creation of your best, happy, most authentic self at, the, at that point? Right. So I... I... I thought that being as much in, like as good as I could be, I wanted to, I wanted to immerse myself in the gospel and be the best that I could in that and, and figured that happiness would come from that as well. I figured if I could, you know, read my scriptures enough that maybe it would help me to, to change or to be better. Um, and so I did everything I could in seminary. I was usually the top. I was always the first person to memorize all of the scripture masteries. And um, I, I just immersed myself in that as well. And I think it was a way for me to, to try to forget or push down and hide those feelings that I had. I loved service. That was a huge thing for me. 
and it i part of that is true when they say you're in when you're in the service of others you know you your happiness and joy comes from serving other people and and i it did for me so i served a lot and i and i loved one of my favorite callings was a uh, gospel doctrine teacher i loved that i loved just talking about the scriptures and different things so i was well well immersed in that um and it was a it was a way for me to try to push away and push off those feelings that I had. Mikael, <laughs> your coming out experience. Way different than Kelsey's. Um, so like I said, my marriage, it wasn't like it was a, you know, horrible. My ex-husband's a super nice guy and we were great friends, but you can only take a great friendship so far. And it, it just became a matter of being comfortable uh, because it was super scary to even think that there could be anything either, you know, I, I initially thought there was something wrong with me or that there could be anything different. And so um, he and I went to school um, the same time we both graduated with our degrees at the same time and started having kids. And my family is, is super dysfunctional. So there was a lot of um, me just immersing myself and trying to fix and take care of other people that it allowed me to not fix or look at my relationship with, with him or with myself. And um, through a, a couple of experiences, you know, I, I had a near-death experience in my late 20s that started to cause me to, to shift my thinking as far as religion went and start looking at, at how I viewed God. I viewed God very similarly to how I viewed my father. He was not loving, he very condemning, and I had to do enough in order to receive either his love or his blessings. And so, like Kelsey, I just immersed myself in trying to be good enough in everybody else's eyes. So, lots and lots of callings, you know, I most often did primary or young women's, and I loved young women's because it gave me an opportunity to try and influence um, the youth you know, in good ways and, and give the young women what I had always wanted. Um, you know, you're okay. God loves you. It's going to be all right. Um, those were kinds of things that I never heard growing up. And so I wanted, I wanted the young women, women that I came in contact with to, f to have that, to feel good about themselves. Um, so I came out, um, my, it's just interesting. I, I had a crush on a really good friend and didn't understand what I was feeling and why I wanted to spend every second with her. And so I started researching. I'm very logical in some ways. And so could I be gay? And of course, the first thing that comes up is if you're researching whether you could be gay, you're probably gay. And then just being like, what? And, and then starting to look at my life and, and saying, oh yeah, okay, that kind of makes sense. Hmm, all right, I see that. Wow, I should have seen that a long time ago. And it was a matter of about six months before I, I got up the courage to say anything to anybody else. And when I came out to my now ex-husband, his words were, yeah, I kind of knew. I, I kind of knew. And then I had a, a prompting um, that came to me several weeks ago that said, what would you do if your wife came to you and said she was gay? And at that moment, there was a lot of different feelings. I felt very angry, like, why couldn't you have said something to me 20 years ago or 15 years ago or 10 years ago when we were, you know, not happy, but also angry at myself. Um, and then I also felt a lot of guilt and a lot of shame because I felt like I had wasted a lot of his life. This is a tough space. It is hard. Let's talk about the, the dating portion. Um, Kelsey's story is probably a little different than yours because you came out well into the marriage. Right. Not only just to yourself, and that self-understanding, but then also as, as part of the dynamic in the marriage. What compelled you, Kelsey, to get married and say, because you already knew well early on into your life, mm -hmm. it's time to get married. Um, I, I should make this journey. Yeah, it uh, it ended up. 
I went to college and at that time I broke up with my girlfriend and we we decided you know we've got to to do this right we've got to follow the gospel and so um, it was into my second year of college um, that I met my ex-husband he was in the same singles ward I was Relief Society president at that time um, and he was the first he was the first guy that came along, return missionary, that showed interest in me, and so I jumped on it. I just, I, I was so, I, I wanted, like Mikkel said, to check the boxes. I wanted to do things right, and um, we dated for like three months, and then we got engaged. So Wilford Woodruff standard? Yeah, yeah. Got so it. yeah, um, and I would not suggest that to anyone. It was. And you weren't even you. You were not not at BYU. No, no. Which was even more. Amazing. I know, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah. And so we didn't know each other very well, um, and I hadn't had experiences with dating a lot of other men or anything. Um, so, you know, here was this guy that showed attention to me, he seemed like he, he liked me, he seemed like he loved me, so we jumped right into that and uh, got married really quick, um, and huh, yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> what about you, Mikkel? Similar to Kelsey, so I was, like I said, graduated high school in Pennsylvania, and so when I was out there, I met a couple of missionaries. My ex-husband served his mission out there, um, but didn't really think anything of him or, um, you know, just kind of a dorky missionary, but graduated high school and came back to Utah to go to school. And this is going to make me sound so old, but email was brand new back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom had emailed him and said, hey, my daughter's out there going to school. You should look her up and and maybe get together sometime. So that's exactly what he did. She had given him my dorm room phone number and uh, he called me up one day and was like, hey, what are you doing? I'm not doing anything and I wasn't doing anything. And so we just started hanging out and, and like Kelsey, this was the first, you know, I was away from home. So away from, you know, my strict environment. And here was this person who, you know, I'm supposed to like because he's nice, he's returned missionary, a nice family, going to school, um, and so why not? So Kelsey's lengthy courtship of three months. Yeah, we <laughs> dated. We so school started in September, and we started you know dating. And when I say that, it's kind of funny, especially looking back on it now. He would call and say, "Hey, let's go do something." And it would be him and all of his friends, and they would all have dates, including my ex-husband. And I'd be like the third wheel with no date. But I'm, I'm a little competitive. And so that that side of me kicked in. And um, we started officially dating, you know, end of October, we got engaged in January. And then we didn't get married until June, because we were waiting for my brother to get home from his mission. Anything so, slower would be disappointing. Right? I was 19 when I got married. And I look at that now and I was such a baby. But that's what I thought I was supposed to do. My parents encouraged it. You know, my dad had called me and told me that he prayed about it and he felt good and this was the person that I was supposed to be with forever. And so that also just, well, this is what I'm supposed to do. And well, that solidified, I mean, at that point you weren't out. No. So there wasn't anything to really solidify other than right. there, there was a connection. Right. There was a... We got along really well. Yeah, that's what I was just wondering. Each each of you both have expressed the, the friendship connection that existed within a relationship. What was missing in each of your relationships? Intimacy. <laughs> Attraction. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for me, I, there actually wasn't much of a friendship there. So that was a, that was a problem um, because we didn't know each other extremely well. Um, and there was that lack of communication we did not commun communicate well with each other. Um, I felt like I had to keep hidden because of the words that he had said, things that he had said against the gay community. And so I, I was scared. I, I didn't want to 
lose my eternal salvation. I, this mm -hmm. is the path that I was supposed to follow. So I didn't have that. Um, communication was a huge thing because of the fear there. And um, yeah, I... Yeah, I was talking to one of my coworkers today and we're in a, a work book club and we're talking about one of Brene Brown's books. And she made this comment about vulnerability and she said, you either are all in or you're, you, you, you can't numb all of the bad and expect the good to just be visible or, or present. When you numb the bad, you numb the good. And that's kind of where I was at. I was really, like Kelsey, people thought we were the picture-perfect couple mm -hmm. because that's what I portrayed. I got really good at, at hiding who I was and how I felt, even to the point where I didn't even recognize some of it. But surely you would agree that if you would have just tried harder, prayed harder, <sighs> a better wife, that's... a cleaner house, all this <laughs> my, would have my house, away. My house was spotless. <laughs> I was the perfect control freak and I'm learning to loosen up a little bit um, because that was my that was my safety was control. If I can control how I feel and I can control the kids and I can control the house, then I'm okay. Not quite the same for me. <laughs> no, I had other outlets that helped me. I I loved exercise, I loved running and so that was my that was my escape, but, but not religion and not well, extra prayers. And I, not... I mean, I did all of that. I did all of that, all of that. You know, there was a point where I felt like if I just go to the temple every week, everything's going to be okay. Because that's what I mean. That's what you're told. That's that's what you, you think that you're supposed to do. And so when you do it. And you think you're doing it as best as you can and as hard as you can and it's not working. It still doesn't feel like you're, you're doing enough. Yeah, it's, it's a hard place to be in. At any point did you get to the space that said, I either try harder and do more or I'm not going to ever be fixed or this will never go away. Did you ever get to that point? Yeah, I would say you know, initially when coming out and, and thinking about things, it was, okay, I've already done everything I possibly can. And it still, still didn't fix anything. It's still, this is still where I'm at. And then I began to question, like, why have I been doing all of this for this, all of this time? Where has it gotten me? I'm still a mess. And, and for me, when I started just sitting with all of that, my, my thoughts were, okay, if I come out, then I'm going to lose my eternal family. I'm going to lose all of my blessings. Um, my world is going to fall apart. So my, my thinking was, I, at that moment, I felt like my options were, I can just disappear. I can commit suicide and nobody ever has to know that I was gay Nobody ever has to know that I, you know, that I've damaged and ruined my family. They don't have to experience the pain and the heartache of me being gay. Yeah, they'll have, they'll have my loss to deal with, but that seemed way easier to deal with than me being gay. It's tough stuff. Mm -hmm. For me, I, I never got to that point. Um, I just... I, I reached that point where I said, I have done everything that I can. And I can either continue to be in a marriage that I'm unhappy for my children and for everyone else but myself. And at one point I was actually committed where I was like, okay, I, I, I will do this. I will do this. And it was at that point that um, my husband actually was like, no, <laughs> I don't want to have to do this. Because I think he recognized how miserable our relationship, our marriage was going to be if it continued because neither of us were happy. So it got to that point where I was like, okay, this is where I need to do this for myself because my happiness matters. And, and so that's... That's when I ended up coming out to my parents and to everyone else. 
Let's drive down this road of divorce. <laughs> um, what? Because uh, this is this is tough stuff too. When you get into the, yeah. <laughs> especially with especially with children, mm-hmm. um, you've created a life, a white picket fence world. Right. Um, and Mikhail, you you hinted at this a little bit. Um, something that was very familiar to me as well. This is not what he bargained for. Right. You were in a marriage that, um, you, uh, different than Kelsey's story, you didn't understand your sexuality through well into the marriage. Right. Kelsey got into a marriage knowing exactly what she was. Right. But yet husbands on both sides, they bargained for something completely different. Mm-hmm. Right. They believed they were getting something completely different. Right. Um, so as candidly and openly as possible, because I think this is a topic that doesn't get much attention, the, uh, the difficult, difficult part about the divorce and the decisions to get to divorce. And that's why I somewhat led up to this. Surely you could have just tried harder, right? That's obviously I mean, the advice that is easily given by therapists and family members. Did you do this? Did you do, did you do it well enough? Were you fasting? Were you praying? How much temple service? Because all of these experiences will help build your marriage. Are you family home evening, date nights? Surely all these things will fix it, right? And when the reality is no, at what point did you finally say it's time? So we, we, my ex-husband and I had discussed, okay, we've, we've been together for 19 years. Could we keep doing this for the sake of the kids? And we considered it for a little while. And then um, we just, we just, said no you know each of us deserves to be happy however that looks and we know that we're not happy right now we're we're not making each other happy as as you know even though we've been trying our hardest and our best and uh it's it's a difficult conversation to navigate especially because like i said all of our family members thought that you know we were the perfect couple in fact i had one of my sister-in-laws say you guys can't get divorced. Like we look to you guys as our example of how to have a good marriage. We're, we weren't happy. We weren't happy. What conversation? What, 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 the day? Um, it's. I don't think there was one day. It was just multiple conversations over time, over the last, you know, over a couple of months of okay, if we get divorced, you know, because there's it's it's a hard conversation. You have to talk about who gets what. You have to divide time with kids. You have to talk about, you know, values and beliefs that shift. For me, I was in the process of the church isn't working for me and it doesn't make me feel happy and I feel triggered when I go and I feel sad. It doesn't bring me peace. And my ex-husband, who's still very active in the church, and that's his sanctuary and that's that's where he goes to get spiritually fed. And so it's a, it's a process of navigating all of that all of that, which is sticky and messy and sometimes really ugly. What about you? Um, the divorce was probably the hardest thing. That was even harder for me than coming out was, I think, um, because I felt guilty. I felt so bad, like Mikkel had said. I, I was married you know, for these six years, and I had two kids with this man, and he just wants to live his life what he thinks is right and and to have love and all of these things and i i felt like i had dragged him through the mud and um it actually took me a long time it was a lot of going to friends and talking to them and being like i don't know what to do i there's so much fear because Mm. there's so many different variables that go into the divorce because what about the kids and what about just everything splitting things up and and you just there's so much fear how am I going to take care of myself how am I going to take care of the kids and so sometimes the fear would drive me back where I'm just like okay I can do this like I can stay in this and then it would it would just lash back out and and I would realize no I Thing as hard and as scary as everything seems with divorce, it's going to be better. It's going to be better. And I had a lot of great friends help me through that where they were just like, you are not happy. Your marriage is not healthy. You need to get out. 
it's better for the children if you get out of this marriage, which was hard because I felt like I was staying in the marriage to for my children, to make it easier for them. But in reality, they could feel the tension. They could see the unhappiness, and it wasn't good for the kids. And so it was through several things, several <laughs> debates and arguments with my, my husband at the time. And we went to the temple, and I... I basically just put out there, I said, okay, God, if, if I'm supposed to stay in this marriage, um, then let me know. But right now I feel like I should leave. And I just felt complete peace. Which I don't think a lot of people understand how God could ask you to do something that seems so contrary to what, uh, you know, his, his teachings are supposed to be. But similar to Kelsey, when I when I fasted and when I prayed about, okay, do I stay in this marriage? Do I keep trying to make it work even with all of all you know all of this new development? I felt so much more peace when I considered leaving the marriage. And not many people it, they they have a hard time wrapping their head around that. I know it was really difficult for my husband because his family sees divorce as this taboo thing like no you don't get divorced so for him it was really hard i know he had to battle a lot of different things and um but in the end we both we both knew that this was what needed to happen this is what should happen and it wasn't easy after that i'd love to say that um that after we got divorced that everything was so much better and it had its moments like it was when after I got divorced there was such a weight off my shoulders of oh, yes this is so good to not have to feel like I have to give him you know try and force things that weren't natural that I didn't want to give and so for that part it was amazing and it was beautiful so liberating um, but it was after I got divorced and my husband remarried that I actually went through a point when I felt like I should just, that I should just be gone. It would be easier for my kids and everyone else if I, if I was gone. But that didn't happen until after the divorce. So Interesting. Mm -hmm. Before, because I think that's something we should explore. Before we get to that point... Um, how did your children react? You each had children in the marriage. Uh, what was that experience like coming out to them and also letting them know of the divorce? And how are they, how are they react? How did they react to that news? So my, my children were a little bit older. Um, my youngest was, I think she was eight, seven or eight at the time. And my oldest was 18 nearing you know he was he was considering going on a mission and um, so coming out to to my children was traumatic in some ways because here's this mom that they have always known and and the the things that I had stressed and tried to teach and kind of pounded into their heads as a very devout Mormon now I'm I'm things have shifted I'm, I things are changing and um, they, you know, they all expressed that they loved me and that, you know, they understood and things were going to be okay. But, you know, initially it's always, change is always hard and it, it's always unsettling at first. And, and I would just say kids are resilient. It just opened up a, a lot of conversation and a lot of just expressing to them, you know, this is nothing that you guys have done. This is not your fault in any way. And this is just... This is just me learning to be happy, and I deserve that, and so does your dad. And just having more open dialogue, I think, helps them transition. And I think that them seeing me be happy and being real has allowed them to start embracing who they are. And um, they've been a lot more open with how they feel and what they think and their own struggles. That's been an amazing thing with her kids. Yeah, we've because seen Kelsey's that. seen that. Yeah, we've seen that where they're a lot more open now. I think it's so good for kids to see that, you know, mom's happy and she can be authentic 
and it helps them to know they can do the same. So, uh, Kelsey, what, uh, what was the experience like for your kids? So I was lucky because my kids, let's see, my little boy was two and my girl was five, four, four or five, when, when we got divorced. So they were pretty young. And that's one thing that I would say has helped tremendously because when they're that young, now it's, because that was three years ago, I think, that I, three or four years now that I've been divorced. And so this is normal. This is normal. Um, I remember talking to my youngest, who was, you know, two at the time, and trying, you know, trying to explain to him, okay, now your dad and I are divorcing and um, I'm gay. (laughs) <laughs> you know, two seconds later in a whole different world, like, yeah. And um, the four or five-year-old, she asked questions, but it was no big deal to her. It was like, okay, mom, so you're, you're gay, okay. And I explained to her, you know, I, I, I'm attracted to other women, okay, no big deal. And so they, as they're growing up and getting older, this is normal. And so that's one thing that I would suggest to anybody who is in a mixed orientation marriage. It's much easier for the kids if you come out when they're younger. Uh, it's harder as they get older, it's, but it's not impossible. But I, I was really lucky that I came out when I did because my kids, they don't know anything different. This is how it, this is how it is. So the ink is now drying on your divorce decrees <laughs> for each of you, you and your experience. Where are you at with uh, religion and faith and spirituality, um, each in your respective journeys, Raquel? Um, so I, I have officially resigned from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints because I don't feel happy there and I can't be part of a system that shuns me and shames me while trying to preach love. It's like, we love you, but there's always a condition. And that has, you know, I've lost family. I've lost friends in that process. Um, It's painful. It's really, really hard. But at the same time, when I was, you know, in, in my faith crisis, trying to figure out the best path for me and presenting myself to God and saying, okay, what is it that you want me to do? Am I supposed to stay in this church? Am I supposed to stay and make it work somehow? And the answer that I received at that time was, no, it's, I want you somewhere else. And, um, you know, I, the, I, the day that I took off my garments was, you know, I, I texted Kelsey. It was super hard. It was very scary because I thought my world was going to come crashing down, that I would never find happiness. I would never find peace that everything was going to fall apart and it hasn't and I still feel like I receive inspiration for my life I still feel like I receive guidance I still am like I'm learning to trust my own authority and my own intuition instead of always relying on someone else to tell me what to do and so I don't I don't practice one particular religion but I do a lot of meditation Um, I do some journaling to help me sort through my thoughts and my feelings and figure out, okay, why is this triggering me and what, what's the root of the issue? And, um, I think that life is amazing. And it's funny because Kelty and I have had conversations before. We're like, we shouldn't be getting this, this blessing, but... (laughs) Here we are getting, you know, we've had... Miraculously uh, there things was, work out. Right. The, the, w- when we first got together, um, I was only working part-time. Kelsey was working in a job that wasn't paying that great. And so money issues were a little bit of an, you know, a, a stress for us. But we weren't going to church. We weren't paying our tithing. We weren't doing any of those things. And somehow, like 500 extra dollars came in. And that helped us pay for rent for that month. And there's been other things along the way that, that you know, if I were still in the religion, I would say that those are, those are blessings from God all along the way. And, and I, you know what, I can't say for sure whether there's a God or not. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Does it really matter? 
if there is, and he wants me to be happy, he wants everybody to be happy. If there's not, We're happy. oh well, yeah, <laughs> life is good. That's a great point. <laughs> it, um, mm -hmm. Whether or not there is a God, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So isn't that the end result? Right. Mm -hmm. Great point. Kelsey, what about you? Oh, so about a year after I divorced, I was still going to church and still trying to make it work. It's funny because I actually went on a few dates with some guys after I divorced. Like, Kelsey! I know, right? <laughs> but you, you just have this perception that maybe it was the, I was with the wrong guy. Right. That maybe if I had somebody different, maybe if we were more compatible friendship-wise or whatever, I could make it work. So um, I, I was so afraid of disappointing, of disappointing my parents, I think, most of all. Uh, because I love my parents. I have great parents. Um, but I just wanted to do everything I could to, to make everyone else happy. <laughs> Common theme in my life. Um, and it was about a year after I divorced that suddenly I was like, what am I doing? I, uh, I went and told my bishop. I said, because I was a librarian in that ward. So uh, single... <laughs> not many friends or family and they put her in the library yep. two kids i'm in the library so i'm like i hate such this. a great place to make friends <laughs> i hate sounds this. like divine inspiration very much so so at this point i go to talk to my bishop because i'm like you know what i'm just gonna tell him and we'll see how you know where things go i'm gonna tell him i don't want to be in the library anymore um, and so I went in to go talk to him and I said, he, he was like, well, I'm so glad you came in to talk to me because I've been thinking about putting you in to be uh, with young women, be a counselor for the young women. And I was like, okay, you know, I, I'm willing to do that. I'm okay with that. Um, I just want to let you know that I'm gay. And he paused and he was kind of like, okay, um, so we'll have to think about the calling. And I was like, oh, okay, because <laughs> I'm a threat to the young women. Like, uh, how does this change anything? And he, and I was like, you know, I just don't feel like I belong here. And he's like, and he tried to tell me, well, we love you. And this was, I think, the first time I'd ever met with him in, in person, seen him. And I was like, love, what does that mean? How can you love me when you don't even know me? And that was kind of the point that I reached. And I was like, you know, here are the keys to the library and I'm done. You can take, you know, my records off, whatever, but I'm, I'm done. And so at that point I left and um, at first there was kind of that, what am I doing? Because it's so ingrained, you know, every Sunday, but I found that I was so much more at peace outside of that than I ever was inside. Um, my, my happy place, my spiritual place has always been outside in nature. Mountains, I love hiking to the top of mountains and that to me is my spiritual place. Um, I felt more spirituality there than I ever did in the temple. And so this was kind of almost like a freedom to me and at this point in my life, I'm not a part of any religion. Um, I, I feel like I'm still very spiritual. Um, I have some good conversations with my dad, who is still active in the church. Um, but my parents, they've, they've been amazing supports in my life. Um, but I, I have great conversations with him. Um, but I, I, I just don't believe in other people dictating my life. Kind of like Mikkel said, there's uh, yeah. Spiri spirituality comes differently for everyone and we should be allowed to live that and practice that how, how we wish. Great advice. Um, and, and sadly, it takes so much pain to get to that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And something that we talked about earlier this price of authenticity, did you ever feel like you could bargain for it or get it at a discount? What did authenticity require of each of you? You know, for a long time I thought that, um, that I could bargain and that I could get it at a discount or um, give a little bit and get a lot back, you know, but 
um, that didn't really get me anywhere. It didn't get me very far. And, you know, like you mentioned um, something about finding, finding a new tribe and leaving, um, you know, getting divorced and leaving Mormonism super scary because I did lose family and friends and you wonder if you're ever going to have real connection again. And that's something that's been interesting too that I'll touch on in just a minute. But, you know, in, in coming out, I, I had a cousin who I knew was a safe space because she had posted LGBTQ stuff that was on her Facebook page that was very supportive. So I came out to her and um, Kelsey and I went down, she lives in Las Vegas, went down to visit her in Las Vegas. And she said, my brother-in-law lives in St. George. You need anything, you get in touch with him and he'll help you. And so I, I did, I, I, one wanted to check out and see who he was, who he really was. And um, I, he owns a pawn shop here in St. George and I was interested in seeing how much I could get out of my wedding ring. Not needing the money right then, but just kind of interested. And so I went in and I met his store manager who is amazing and he's one of my best friends now, but him and his boss and their families have completely enveloped us and been such a great support and, and they are now who I consider my family since my family has, has cut me off. Um, and along that way, I've noticed that as I'm more real and as I'm more authentic, it allows me to have greater connection with other people because I think that there's value in sharing our pain and our joy. And that's something that I never really felt like I had in the church. It was, it's all surface. It's how are you? How are the kids? How's your husband's job? But nothing like, I don't want to hear about your pain. I don't want to hear about what you're struggling with. Just tell me the good parts. So it's been interesting to step out of that and find people that are, I think people are begging for that real connection. They want to know, they want to know my pain because then it helps validate their pain and we can talk about it and it's amazing. We've talked a lot about pain so far in today's <laughs> podcast. Yeah. But there was a day that Mikkel met Kelsey or Kelsey met Mikkel. <laughs> it, which is really funny because I had come out to some friends who were lesbians and they said, you have to talk to Kelsey because she has a similar story. So my friend gave me Kelsey's phone number and I had, we had been texting for a little while, you know, because I knew she understood. And then, then we decided to meet. Just to talk, just yeah, to talk just about to our share stories. stories. And, yeah. I yeah. thought she was really cute. <laughs> yeah. I remember yeah. what she was wearing, which is so funny. <laughs> she does. She remember. She was like, what was I wearing? I'm like, um, <laughs> I don't know, but you were really cute. <laughs> I couldn't remember my wife's wedding dress. So <laughs> it's okay. That's great. Uh, yeah. So we just, uh, we immediately hit it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the rest is history, I guess. I don't I know. Want, I want the history. Ah. This is perfect. So we, I was still, <laughs> still living in my ex-husband's house, we had officially decided we were going to get divorced, but still married, um, but separated. You know, he was sleeping in one part of the house and I was sleeping in another. And he had, he had said, um, if you feel like you need to have an affair, you like, go do that, whatever you need to do. And he said that without really feeling that way, because when I did start, you know, seeing Kelsey, it was really painful and hard for him to, to let go. Um, which I can understand. Right. But like the first time we kissed, like I said, it, it, to me, it felt like the most normal and natural thing. And I had butterflies and I was excited and I, I had never experienced that with my husband. And I just thought that, that there was something wrong with me. I didn't know that that's the way it was supposed to feel, that that's the way it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Those, so, those happily ever after stories, you know, you watch those chick flicks where, you know, they just seem so in love and so happy. And I always thought that's not real. Yeah. These are it's just bogus. These are movies. That's not real. And then, and then I met Mikkel and it's real. If, if you're not feeling that in your marriage, that you should be because it really is real. And I didn't even know it until I met her. So we've been together for a little over a year. A year and a couple of months. Mm -hmm. So, 
Yeah. And it's it's not perfect. I mean, no, we have ups and downs uh-huh. just like anybody else does. But I would say it's, it's much healthier and it's so much better. <laughs> the, the lows aren't nearly what they were when I was married to my husband. The things are bearable. Things well, more bearable. than bearable. Yeah. Things are beautiful. Things are wonderful. And I just, you have no idea until you, you find that. And it's been really awesome too, because we have kids that, you know, we're a blended family now. And um, I, I think that our kids have adjusted really well. They have mm-hmm. their moments just like any other sibling, sibling group does. But for the most part, they get along. We've been really lucky. Yeah, they do really well. Yeah. Yeah. So. What source or where did you go for strength and connection as, as you navigated this territory? You're divorced, starting to date. Um, where does a divorcee from a mixed orientation marriage, self-identifying, find strength? Um, and we've talked a little bit about family, a little bit about friends, but someone who's listening to this podcast, who's in your shoes, and maybe at, I mean, there are various stages of marriage They're in a marriage, they're just leaving a marriage, they're contemplating leaving the marriage. Where did you find hope and strength and advice? Ooh, that, I, that's a little tricky because I initially turned to whatever church related resources I could find. So I joined the affirmation community, which is a huge resource for me initially, um, and reached out to several people. There's a mothers of affirmation that's specifically geared towards women in um, mixed orientation marriages, I think, or yeah, or just or mothers of lesbians. Too. Yeah, it's not just for mothers. So, so it, there were a couple of people who I shared my story with, who just reached out and said, "If you need anything, here's my phone number," or "Don't hesitate to text me or call me, like day or night." Um, but then also realizing that I've been through some pretty hard things in my life, I'm gonna figure this out. And so it's a matter of, for me at least, it was a matter of not looking at the big picture right away because that can be super scary and very overwhelming. It's Mm -hmm. what can I do through to get through today? And then what can I do to get through tomorrow? And not looking at anything else, which for someone like me who, you know, I like control and I like a plan and everything's got to be just so, that that was in some ways very liberating to just give myself permission to say, okay, I'm just going to get through today and whatever that looks like, it's going to be okay. It's great advice. Yeah. And there are so many communities out there. Um, you don't realize it. I, it's so hard because the LDS church is your community. And so when you step out into the unknown, it's very scary to think that you could be alone. Nobody wants to be alone. Um, And there are lots of groups, lots of people out there. Just like Mikkel said, her her story with her cousin. uh, All you have to do is reach out to somebody who you can trust. um, And you never know what doors will open to the groups. And there, there are people everywhere who are, like I said, have their arms open and are just waiting for you to come. And so... It's been cool, too, because Kelsey's parents, you know, when she initially came out to them, they also needed support Mm -hmm. and had questions that they wanted answers to. And so they found Facebook communities that they could go to for parents of of gay children and um, found a lot of love and support and were able to get get questions answered. So, you know, there's, there's resources available. And if you don't know who to contact, you can message me and I'll help try Mm -hmm. and find you people. Somebody for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. My parents have loved that. They've loved the resources. It's helped them to understand and also have, because they need support. They need people who they can reach out to and be like, oh, I don't know what to do. And these people who have maybe been through it for a year, two, three, you know, can be like, it's okay. You know, this is, this is okay. Here's what we can do. And it's great. All right. Shifting gears just a little bit yeah. as we wrap up the podcast. 
I always like to I always like to conclude the podcast with some pieces of, of advice. So if you had the op the opportunity to sit down with parents of a closeted mm -hmm. daughter, what would you tell them? <laughs> love. Just love them. Don't feel like it's your job to fix them or change them or um, get them to, I don't know, not, not choose this lifestyle. Just love them. I think realize and know that, that this is who they are. Um, and if they're not sure if their child is, is gay, um, but they're thinking maybe it's, it's kind of the same way. If you think you might be gay, you are. It, it's probably the same way. If you think your child is gay, they probably are. And the best thing that you can do is just love and support them, like Mikkel said, and let them know that it's okay. And don't go into it thinking that you can change them because this is who they are. And when they know that it's safe and that you will love them no matter what, it will help them tremendously and they will thank you. They will thank you for the rest of their life because with me and my parents, that's, that's how it is. What is your advice to the closeted husband or wife who is in their marriage contemplating the future? It's not your fault because I felt a lot of guilt and my husband felt like he did something wrong in the marriage. He should have, he felt like he should have tried harder. So to the, the closeted, you know, straight or non straight. Right. Spouse. I would say it's not your fault and don't assume that guilt or that, um, that shame. And there again, just try to seek understanding and, um, be as supportive and as loving as you can and there's resources available to help you through this process as well because I know it's hard yeah it's gonna be hard it's going to be hard no sugarcoating it but it's worth it that's yeah Kelsey's ex-husband is now remarried and mine's in the process he's engaged and set to be married so there is light at the end of the tunnel um, sometimes it just takes a little bit of patience and um, but it, it all it all does end up working out mm -hmm. and i guarantee it's so much better yeah you will be so happy both straight and gay it's it's gonna be okay my ex-husband made a comment it, he texted me and he was like i you know i thought things were good with us until i've you know now i'm with my fiance and we're set to be married and but i didn't realize that this is what i could have had Love. So it's been yeah. it's been good for him too, mm -hmm. you know. As hard as and as painful as it's been, it's been really good for him too. Uh, that's part of the problem is so many of us go into you know we've never been married before, so we don't know. We are naive to what things should be like. So it is. It's the straight and the gay, you know, partner. They don't know what they're missing out on or what it can be like. So it it's hard, but you can do it. All right, a more bold and more difficult question. If you were able to stand in front of the Quorum of the Twelve, the leadership of the church, where this, this topic and this podcast specifically targets um, people with a background in Mormonism, what is your advice to the leadership of the church? What would you tell them? Things have to change. They have to. If they want to continue influencing and um, helping people, it has to change. And an example of change? Um, the, the policies of exclusion have to change, um, their perception of, you know, heterosexuals being the only people that are allowed access to the kingdom of God, like some of that, it has to change because it's, it's damaging it's hurtful and there you you have to take away the condition we love you but love isn't conditional mm. but i don't I, I don't know if that's ever going to happen and that's a hard one um because i have some pretty pretty strong feelings um i have been hurt i have been hurt by the church I have been hurt by the words that these men say. 
um, they say that this is of God, that what they say um, comes directly from him. If that is love, if this is the God and his love, I don't want any part of it. But they need to know the lives that they are hurting, the lives that are being taken away because of their words. And that needs to stop. Love is the most important thing. And if they truly believe in Christ and his teachings of love, then they need to start living it. And they need to start teaching it. Because I guarantee this is not what Christ would say. This is not what Christ would do. Christ preached love. It's time to love. We see love. I feel love. <laughs> I am more happy than I have ever been. Ever been. And I hope that people watching this can see that. That I am not wanting anymore. I am not broken. I never was, but now I know it. I'm not broken. I am so happy and I am so in love. And this is not a bad thing. I wish everyone could feel this love. Gay, straight, whatever. Everyone should feel this kind of love. Mikhail, Kelsey, thank you. Yeah. Your Thanks. story is inspirational. It's been difficult. And as we discussed earlier, it's worth it. It feels worth it. It feels authentic and it feels honest. And that's what we're looking for. Thank you for allowing us into your home mm -hmm. yeah. to share in this journey for, I mean, the brief amount of time that we've had. Uh, we covered a lot of territory. Um, but again, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and being vulnerable and opening up your story to allow other people to, I don't want to just say heal, but I also, I also want to say become Yeah. to allow them to grow as well. Thanks. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Another great episode of Latter Gay Stories podcast. Um, as we mentioned earlier in the podcast, uh, Mikkel and Kelsey, you're both open for your suggestions, questions, um, comments. If you uh, found yourself somewhere along that journey or currently find yourself somewhere within this journey of coming out, um, accepting and understanding what your sexuality looks like and wondering what's next in your um, experience, feel free to message us. Uh, if you want to message directly, you're welcome to uh, email and all of your emails will remain anonymous to stories at lattergaystories.com, uh, .org, and I will forward those comments directly to uh, Mikkel and Kelsey, and they can uh, respond directly. And if you're watching this on the audio version, um, you're welcome to comment below um, on our YouTube channel or the Facebook channel, where we will respond back to that as well. The mission of Latter Gay Stories is to help people find a level of authenticity and honesty that's new in their world. And I hope through today's podcast episode, you were able to make that connection as well and realize as Mikkel and Kelsey talked about, it's worth it. Um, there are three great things that I think we, we gained out of this podcast episode. That one, you're not broken, that you're not alone, and that your best days are ahead. It's through experiences like this that we heard through Mikkel and Kelsey today that you are able to find that level of authenticity and honesty that works for you. It's through experiences like this that you are able to continue your latter-day story.